Hi, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we do with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to bring you a SALT talk with Kristen Smith of the Blockchain Association, talking about uh, the public policy movement around crypto, Bitcoin, digital assets generally. Kristen is one of the, the leading players in Washington and has been for several years around trying to shape and educate uh, lawmakers around crypto and why we all believe on this call that it's the, the future of finance and uh, sort of a democratizing force within uh, our society and within our financial system. Uh, but just a little bit more about Kristen. Kristen is the executive director of the Blockchain Association, which is the Washington DC based trade association representing more than 80 of the industry's leading companies. Uh, Kristen serves as a liaison between policymakers and the cryptocurrency industry to assist in the creation of legislation and regulation that promotes the growth of the cryptocurrency ecosystem in the United States. She's also a leading public voice advocating for cryptocurrency and blockchain industry uh, through top tier media interviews, op-eds and letters to the editor and in global, global speaking engagements, including our recent SALT conferences. Uh, Kristen is a renowned voice for the industry and has been featured on Fortune's 2020 40 under 40 list, Coindesk's 20, uh, 2021 50 people who defined the year in crypto, and Cointelegraph's 2022 top 100 influencers in crypto and blockchain. And Chris, I don't know, were you ahead or behind Anthony on that list? But either oh, way, I was totally ahead of Anthony on that. Yeah, that's list. what I thought. I, I th that's what I thought, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to say it. But um, prior to leading the Blockchain Association, Kristen helped blockchain and technology companies achieve their public policy objectives in Washington. She served as a Senate and congressional aide on Capitol Hill for nearly 10 years, much of which was spent focusing on technology policy. Uh, she co-founded HODL PAC, which currently serves on the or and currently serves on the organization's board of directors. Uh, Kristen has a Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web Board member, an independent director also for Skybridge Capital's G and G2 funds. So Kristen, it's, uh, it's great to have you on Salt Talks. Uh, hosting today's talk is Brett Messing, who is the president and co-chief investment officer at Skybridge. Uh, Skybridge, for those on this call that, that don't have backgrounds, Skybridge has been around since 2005, was founded by Anthony Scaramucci. Over the last several years, we've made uh, very heavy investments in the crypto blockchain digital asset space. Uh, you know, I introduced myself as the managing director of SALT. I'm also a partner at Skybridge. So very excited to have these conversations with leading players in the crypto space like Kristen. Uh, now that I've used up all the oxygen in the room, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brett uh, to begin the conversation with Kristen. Well, I, I just want to add on the relative Kristen and Anthony ranking that if Kristen was like driving in L.A. traffic and she looked behind her, she would not be able to see Anthony wherever he may be. So um, there is some distance between the two of them. Um, so, Kristen, thank you so much for, for coming here. Um, when we first got into crypto, there were a couple of risks that were high on our list. Uh, regulatory was probably one. In fact, when we made a decision to allocate to Bitcoin um, in our flagship fund, we got a lot of pushback from the SEC and had five different meetings with them. And, and it was clear they really didn't want us to do it. We were able to do it. And, you know, the rest is sort of history. A lot has happened on the regulatory front. I would say a year ago, my biggest concern was that crypto was going to become a partisan issue like everything else, right? If we can make masks partisan, why not crypto? As we saw various Republicans embracing it, right, from the mayor of Miami to Texas and Wyoming. Um, and that seems to have changed massively. Um, Janet Yellen, in an interview recently with Aaron Ross Sorkin, had a few comments it's almost worth Googling, that were just mind boggling to hear a Democratic Secretary of the Treasury say, can you just talk about the journey that sort of took us from literally partisan Bitcoin or crypto to today where Elizabeth Warren seems to be on an island? I have a feeling we're not going to be hearing as much from her on this issue. Um, but anyway, I, 
I turn the stage to you to address that because I think it's a big deal. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a huge deal. And it might be the, when we look back through 2022, you know, in December, I think we're going to realize that this is the year that everything shifted and everything changed, which is fantastic. Um, I think part of the reason that there was initially a partisan divide really goes to the origins of Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin obviously has a libertarian philosophy around it. And I think it's one of the reasons that we saw Republicans, particularly like House Republicans, that were getting interested in this. But obviously, the benefits of digital assets and cryptocurrencies and crypto networks and all of the things in the ecosystem that we all care about, um, you know, they, they they solve problems that appeal to both Democrats and Republicans. Um, these are very democratizing assets. They're uh, potentially answers to some of the concerns about big finance or big tech. Uh, it's a U.S. competitiveness issue. It's a financial inclusion issue. These resonate with both sides of the aisle. And I, when I started this job nearly four years ago, I thought, well, certainly this is going to be a naturally partisan or bipartisan issue over time. Uh, but I, like you, Brett, a year ago, I, I, I had I talked to some advisors and some consultants and I said, do we just need to go all in on Republicans because this isn't working? <laughs> like, what are we doing wrong here? And I think what changed all of that was last summer when we had this infrastructure bill go through uh, that had this bad provision that did a very broad definition of what a broker was that was jammed in. It was very bad for crypto. I think what we saw is for the first time, Congress really experienced um, in the White House, uh, you know, indirectly, they really experienced the political power of the crypto community and the crypto ecosystem. This is there, there hadn't, you know, there, there'd been a couple opportunities where, you know, everybody got to be riled up and, and weigh in with, you know, FinCEN, for example, back at the end of the Trump administration. But this past summer was really the first time that people were able to collectively share their voice with Congress. And I think that that resonated. I think prior to last summer, the thinking among your everyday policymaker was like, oh, great, we'll just let Gary Gensler handle this because he seems to care about it. And I don't have the time to learn or think about this. That's totally shifted. I think Congress wants a seat at the table. I think the White House recognizes the political force that the crypto community has, and they don't want to be on the wrong side of history. So, yeah, I think Elizabeth Warren, I think Brad Sherman, maybe even to a certain extent, Gary Gensler, they're they're now um, sort of the outliers and the mainstream thinking might not be you know, hey, we're a crypto champion, but people are crypto curious and they really want to understand this space and be a part of the solution. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. I rest a lot better at night knowing that that we have turned that corner and um, we're able to have intelligent conversations with both sides of the aisle. So, you know, we are um, we at Skybridge try to actually stay out of politics because, as you might be aware, Anthony had a stretch of <laughs> politics that didn't end that well. Uh, but we it's are very much long, so it was fine. <laughs> actually, actually, it ended very well for him. But um, you know, it was a bit traumatic, at least during the time. Um, but we, for the first time, have contributed to a pack that's backing candidates. Um, I mean, isn't it the case that crypto money is playing a, a big role in this? You know, the people aren't just finding revolution. You know, um, religion on this. Uh, money is being intelligently funneled into races. I mean, you know, I know you're yeah. involved as well. Um, it's, I wish it was all about mission, but it, 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 there is some like on the ground pragmatic politics going on that I know you're leading some, if you could just speak to that a little bit. Yeah, no, I think the, the, Part of the political power isn't just that individual constituents will pick up the phone and call their senator's office. Um, part of the political power is money. And um, there are a lot of people in crypto who have a lot of money. And up until even, you know, not even a year ago, this didn't seem to be within, in, within reach. But again, I think starting after the infrastructure debacle last summer, there was a real interest with people who've had success in this space to put their money where their mouth is and start to help support candidates who are pro crypto because if we can get you know candidates to be pro crypto and they go into congress then you know everything else sort of 
uh, you know, there's a domino effect from there. I think that, um, you know, we're seeing this on a couple different levels. We have super PACs that are, you know, they're designed to pick very specific races and put a lot of money into supporting the campaign of a single candidate. Um, they don't directly support the campaign. It's sort of an independent effort, um, but we're seeing that happen. Um, we're seeing um, a lot of fundraisers come together in cities across the country for different members of Congress uh, who are already in, in the House or Senate uh, to support them. Um, we're seeing um, a hotel pack that John mentioned before. That's that's an effort that is targeting these sort of smaller dollar donors that might have a lot of interest and want to give a couple hundred bucks to candidates. That's a resource for, for them. So we're seeing it um, at the large dollar level and all the way down to the low dollar level. And I think we're that's only getting more sophisticated as time goes by. And I think um, it makes a real impact because I, I worked as a staffer on Capitol Hill for, for 10 years. And, you know, money matters, right? Because these is particularly in the House, but also in the Senate, you know, your typical House race is a few million dollars, right? Your Senate races are often more than $10 million for a candidate, an individual candidate to have to raise in in order to get reelected. And so that money doesn't just show up, right? It comes in these days, $5,800 increments because an individual can only give a maximum of $5,800 to a campaign. So the, the members of Congress spend a lot of time raising money because they have to if they want to stick around. And so if the crypto community can use their need to raise money as a way to build relationships, I think it's a good thing. It's a tool that we have at our disposal. And now that the crypto community gets that and is willing to, to be generous on that front, I think that's that's also very much helping um, you know, change the political environment in Washington. Um. There's an issue I think is important for adoption and sort of prices going higher, which I wanted to touch on, which is, um, you know, crypto is is still largely owned by young people. It's it's massively under owned by institutionals institutions. And if you look at like, well, where's the, the real wealth in the United States? It's people 52 to 75. Mm -hmm. And in those folks, it's just massively, massively under owned. And I have had many conversations where, with friends of mine in Los Angeles, where it's interesting regionally, like it's well owned in the Bay Area. In LA, it's very under owned. And, you know, I'll make my Bitcoin pitch and I've had people say, okay, I'm going to buy some. How do I do it? And then I explain it to them and they're like, fuck it. Ooh, sorry, yeah. John, I'm going to have to edit it. Um, because, you know, they haven't opened a new relationship in over a decade, right? They, they're a Goldman Sachs or a JP Morgan private banking client. Maybe they bank with City National Bank, right? If they could pick up their cell phone and call someone and, you know, buy a half a million dollars of Bitcoin, they would do so. But like, they don't want to open a NIDIG account. They don't want to open a Fidelity account. So, so th there seem to be two obvious solutions to that. If you can address each of them, I'd appreciate it. One is obviously a spot ETF. Uh, and the second is, you know, when will banks just you know, good old banks be able to offer these kind of solutions to, um, you know, retail clients? Yeah, I mean, I think the there those are things that inevitably will happen. I don't know how quickly they're going to happen. I think the ETF question, um, I think most people, you and I agree, that we really need to have a spot ETF option, that it's not, you know, the the futures ETFs, you have to deal with backwardation and contango and all these things I don't even understand. Like nobody wants to deal with that, right? You need to have something that closely tracks and even, um, you know, products like uh, GBTC or, um, you know, some of these uh, trusts out there that track the price, price of Bitcoin, there's a huge disparity in between the actual asset and the in the share of that. And so a, a spot ETF is the, the logical place uh, next step. I think what, you know, Gary Gensler at the SEC has said is that he doesn't want to do that until there is regulation of the 
crypto spot market. And today there's no easy place to do that. You've got the SEC, which only deals with securities, but if you have something like Bitcoin that's a commodity, there's no commodity spot market regulator. I think um, it's the sort of consensus of blockchain association members that the CFTC is the right home for that kind of regulation. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with the CFTC. We've had a lot of conversations with the Senate Agriculture Committee, the House Agriculture Committee. Uh, the reality is to do this in a comprehensive way, it's going to take an act of Congress to get that done. And so something at some point is going to have to give either, um, you know, there's going to have to be some sort of process lawsuit against the SEC to get them to budge, or we're going to have to make some progress on spot regulation. And I think that that's something that could potentially move even next year, but that is not a 2022 type of activity. Um, I suppose the third thing would be there could be like a change in leadership with the SEC, but I don't see that uh, in the cards anytime soon. Um, I think um, with, um, I'm, I'm, what was your second point? It was the uh, Bitcoin ETF and the- uh, The question is, it's just, you know, um, right, there was a woman, I can't remember her name, who was appointed to head the OCC. She- Oh, yes. through. I think Thanks. it was pretty clear she wasn't going to be friendly to crypto. Um, uh, you know, again, just, just being able to have it stored at a bank, um, uh, I think feels very natural to people, even almost more yeah. so than, than, than an ETF. Uh, what do you, what, what, what's preventing that? Well, I think, I think it's, comfort around the regulation. Like, I, I actually think it could be a, a spot market regulatory issue there as well. I mean, I think the OCC in the past has said that banks, um, you know, can custody crypto assets. So that's a good role for a bank to do. Um, and, you know, that's a piece that, that already exists. I think in my conversations with institutions, um, you know, they're, they're a little bit slower to move or with, with banks, I should say, financial institutions, not investor institutions, but but with the banks, there I think there's a lot of interest there, uh, but they're nervous, right? This is not something that they're used to doing. I mean, with the exception of obviously, there's a few very like crypto focused banks out there, but um, I think this is something that as consumers demand more and more of this, they're gonna wanna have a piece of this. And um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, there's an education level, a comfort level issue. Uh, there's a little bit of a regulation issue, but, you know, there isn't a whole lot in place um, that could, you know, prevent somebody who wanted to go forward with that today from, from offering those kind of services. But yeah, it is a little bit problematic when you have changes with, with one regulator to the next, and you've got one who's very, you know, sort of pro banks adopting crypto, and then you have voices come in, you don't actually have a confirmed controller right now. Um, you know, th that's, that's a little bit of a different environment. And I think, you know, ban banks are mindful of that as well. So it could also mean a, we might need a personnel change at some point at, at the OCC, um, you know, in order to pave the way for, for financial institutions to feel more comfortable. So, so by Biden passed an executive uh, order right on on crypto sort of ordering you know the agencies to sort of put together comprehensive rules and and it seems clear that Yellen is driving that you know she's you know gave the first speech ever right by a secretary of treasury do you think it's possible that just to be blunt Gary Gensler used to think that Elizabeth Warren was his boss and now he might realize that Janet Yellen is his boss and that <laughs> will lead him to conclude because there is there is a and he's building to he is building a path to a spot ETF, right? He, I don't want to get all technical on 40 Act, 33 Act kind of stuff here today, but he did approve a futures. There was a recent approval that is, again, for technical reasons, a step in the direction. He's given himself a path to approve it. You know, we don't want to play a CNN crossfire here, but do you think that this, the political environment is changing in a way where the same people might reach different conclusions because essentially their bosses are implying to them that they should. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if Gary Gensler thinks he has any boss, <laughs> number one, but yeah, um, uh, you, you know, he is an independent regulator. He's, he's obviously, uh, you know, very, you know, he's gone very deep in, in trying to understand this space. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's a couple of things. I mean, I think um, Chair, 
Chairman Gensler has, you know, very strong opinions on how things should be done. He, he really wants, you know, he, he believes a lot of assets outside of Bitcoin are securities. Um, he wants, you know, those um, companies, either the projects and, or the exchanges to come and register with the SEC. And you know, he's been very sort of big on that. But, you know, with Bitcoin, um, you know, he doesn't have any clear authority over the market. So that's a little bit of a tougher situation. Um, I do think though that Gensler is a very politically savvy person and that his, um, you know, sort of relationship with Elizabeth Warren, you know, she sits on the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, he has to report to those committees if he ever wants any other financial regulator position out there, he would have to go through the Senate Banking Committee. I think, um, you know, the two of them, I, I get the impression, have a, a fairly healthy dialogue um, and, and a strong, you know, at least political relationship. So it's, um, um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I just don't get the sense that Gensler is, is looking to Yellen. Um, I think Gensler, in some ways, is informing Elizabeth Warren's policy more than Elizabeth Warren is informing Gensler's policy. Um, but yeah, at some point, you know, the, the, the problem and the challenge that Gensler has is that you have, you know, tens of millions of Americans that own Bitcoin and they, you can't just, um, you know, do sort of drastic things that change the cryptocurrency market because it's going to impact a lot of people and those people will pick up the phone and call their congressman or senator. So, um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how things go. I'm, I'm hopeful that there is some sort of path forward. I'm not optimistic that it's going to be, you know, this year on an ETF, but but I would like to think that as the political pressure mounts that that there will be an appetite for for getting one approved soon. Okay. Cool. Uh let's talk Bitcoin mining. So, you know, as as we in the crypto community say like there's always various attack vectors that we need to be on 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 the out look out, look out for. Um it seems like, you know, there were recent hearings on Bitcoin mining and, you know, Jamie Dimon has criticized, you know, Bitcoin as being, right, sort of a dirty, you know, a dirty asset. Um, I guess, is that something we should be worried about? Um, just to, to, to globalize the issue, right, the, the EU had a, um, a proposal before their legislative body recently that was defeated, but not meaningfully so, that would have, I guess, over some amount of time, banned Bitcoin mining in, in Europe. Um, I don't know if you could please you know, speak to that, because obviously you know, mining and proof of work is, is, is a big part of Bitcoin. Um, the energy issues are nuanced. The regulatory issues might be less so. Yeah, no, the, the energy issue, I think it's one of those, it, it's a little bit like illicit finance. If you don't like crypto, but you don't really understand it, you need some reasons to be against it. And so it's easy to be like, oh, criminals use it, or oh, it burns like all of this energy, like it's therefore it's bad. Um, I think that the challenge with Bitcoin is it does consume energy and that is what makes it strong, right? And so it's, it's a you know, some would argue a feature, not a bug of the proof of work system, right? And the, I think what we need to do more education on, and, and the House Financial Services actually had a hearing, or I'm sorry, not House Financial Services, the House Energy and Commerce Committee Oversight Subcommittee did a really good, what I thought, like very balanced, nuanced hearing on Bitcoin mining back in January. And what um, what sort of came out of this was, the fact that since China cracked down on Bitcoin mining, a lot of that mining has moved to the US. And when it's in the US, the companies that are doing the mining here tend to, not exclusively, but tend to try to use as much renewable um, sources in their energy mix as possible. And in fact, in some cases, they often sort of co-locate with renewable energy resources because they can very easily be turned on and off. They can take the excess capacity when there is some, they can like dial down when, when it's, you know, not needed. And, and there's actually a pretty good story in that Bitcoin is helping deploy more renewables. It's again, it's small, but it's a trend that's picking up um, and that we're starting to see more announcements around there. But, you know, I think, um, I think that just takes education, right? And I think if you look at 
the energy consumption of the financial services industry or, you know, any other sort of major group. Like, yeah, there's there's a cost to that. And we don't go around necessarily highlighting that one specific thing because everybody knows that that's valuable and we need that service. I think as more people understand the value of Bitcoin, they'll be able to have a more nuanced conversation. On the regulatory side, we're not actually seeing a whole lot going on at the federal level. The, the Office of um, Science and Technology Policy out of the White House right now is doing a request for information around uh, energy and climate concerns and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And that's part of this executive order process, which I think is, is great, right? Because it allows for a sharing of information and debate and discussion. And that's all, those are all good things. The, the problem areas we've seen on the regulatory side around Bitcoin mining are at the state level. And most notably, New York State has a bill right now that would do a moratorium on uh, proof of work mining in, um, in in the state of New York. And so that's something um, that we we actually opened an Albany office like six weeks ago to, to work on this. And, and that's something that, um, you know, we need to um, pay attention to, but I don't see anything on the federal level yet. And you do see states like particularly Texas that are doing everything they can to incentivize miners to come to their state. So, um, you know, I think we want to have mining here in the U.S. I think, um, you know, obviously Bitcoin is stronger the more decentralization there is and the more nodes are on the network. But when we do it here, we have a better sense of what kind of energy is being used. And it's also, I think, just from a national security perspective, better to have um, the mining capacity here in the U.S. where we know that it's safe and, you know, um, not something that's subject to being cut off from the Internet like you might have in some other countries around the world. Um, so let's talk about New York for a second. Um, I'm an Angelino living in New York, and I'm in Midtown right now where 30% of the people are in the offices and everyone else is still at home. Um, and it's the least crypto-friendly state, right, in the country. Um, there are a number of things we at Skybridge do where, gratefully, we have a Florida office because we, we wouldn't be able to stake certain assets or e even actually even open account with certain counterparties if we use our New York address. You know, you can't open an account with Kraken or FTX because they don't have what's called a bit license in New York. I, I guess, first question, is this just like the legacy financial system controlling the state government and it may has made it crypto unfriendly? Because again, for a state that keeps losing electoral votes, People to Florida, where you've now moved. Sorry, not to out your location. I know we've that's bad <laughs> opsec. On a plane to DC in the morning. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a big state though. Um, just from an economic development standpoint, it seems incredibly unwise. Um, so I guess you know, is it sort of a form of like regular, you know, just let's call it corruption. You know, like legal corruption, but like a corrupting of the political process. Yeah, I think I think the bit license, I mean, I don't know if it's a corrupting of the political process. I, I, I wasn't around when the bit license was created, but it, it, as I sort of look back from where we are today, it's one of those examples of why you don't always want to rush to regulate the new thing, because what you might do is make that new thing impossible to grow. And this is exactly what's happening in New York for all the reasons you described. Um, I think the good news on the bit license front is that Adrian Harris, the new superintendent of DFS, is has a fintech background. And one of the things she's trying to do right now is to speed up the timeline for getting a bit license. Like it's kind of crazy if you think about it that a company like Kraken or a company like FTX US, which has been you know growing and there's a huge demand for their services, like can't operate in the state of New York. Like that's actually sort of crazy. And it's a huge disservice to consumers in New York or people like you that want to engage with these actors. And so I think there's a real um, opportunity, again, probably not this year, but, you know, in in um, 2023 to, to push for a slightly more streamlined version of the bit license, because there are other states where um, you know, you get your money transmitter license and it's a little bit of a painful process, but it's much less onerous than than the bit license process. And so I think if, you know, 
Mayor Adams and, and now others um, in Albany that are serious about keeping crypto in New York, like this is something that they're going to have to do. And I think the, you know, the political power of crypto, as we discussed, is growing and we need to show some of that in New York so that we can get a more favorable regime. But I don't know, you you were you were probably doing doing this uh, or you, you may have more insight than I do on this. But yeah, I don't think it's a shady backroom deal. I just think it's like some people just if they see something new, they have to regulate it when really the right answer was to give this little space and like, let's, let's see how it develops and, you right. know, consumers no, in other states, like they, they could be fine in New York too. No, that's, that's fair. It, it's, it's when a bureaucracy or a new f- regular framework gets put in place, it's very hard to undo that. So I think it was probably just unwisely constructed and to your point, prematurely so and it's just, it's just hard to fix. Um, yeah. And I don't think there's been the political will to fix it, but I think now, given the political power of the crypto community and just the, just the massive job creation, I mean, the, yeah. it just, it, it's just staggering the amount of you know, capital dollars and human capital that, that, that's flowing in, into crypto. Um, so one thing I think people thought they would see is traditional finance companies buying crypto companies to get into crypto. And I think what's happening is crypto is getting too big for them to buy. And instead, crypto companies are acquiring licenses, right? So FTX bought a company called LedgerX, which was largely a license acquisition. You know, uh, you know, LedgerX hadn't really scaled their business. And so, so the, the key asset they had was they had some important CFTC licenses. Coinbase made a similar acquisition. FTX, as you and I discussed recently, just took a stake in IEX, which is a stock exchange. Do you see more of that? Is that important? Is that the path where we might where we might be headed in terms of um, sort of a more regulated market infrastructure, uh, almost bottoms up instead of top de- top down? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a faster path than waiting for Congress or even a regulator to come up with uh, better guidance, right, or or some sort of framework for doing this. Um, yeah, it's sort of a, if you think about it, like, boy, that's not how it's supposed to be. Like, you shouldn't be able to go just like buy those things up. But the reality is that's how it, how it, how it works. And I think FTX um, in particular has taken advantage of this more than anyone, but other exchanges as well have it, various points, you know, acquired broker dealers or other sort of licenses uh, to have their bases covered there. Um, I think that, that, um, you know, I think that it's, it's a little bit easier to move forward on the CFTC side than it is on the SEC side, because the SEC has been slower to, even, even, even on like the tokenized security side, right? They've been slower to approve the use of these licenses for anything related to digital assets. Um, I actually, you know, really applaud the CFTC and, and Chair Benham for, you know, being open to considering some of these ideas, like even the proposal that FTX has uh, before the CFTC right now. Like, I think that's great that the CFTC is willing to have these discussions and dialogues and try to figure out a path forward. And um, and that I think that is one strategy, um, arguably maybe the fastest strategy, um, because to do something comprehensive for something totally new uh, is going to take a long time. And that that's, you know, that's a three to five year process, right? So, um, so yeah, no, I think I think the license strategy is a good one. Yeah, you know, it seems to me like the, uh, the politics of crypto is such that the people who are for it are almost single issue, issue voters. And the people who aren't for, for it or aren't involved in crypto, I, I think just don't care. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I, I, yeah, they're not against I don't it. think there are people waking up. It's not like the, you know, issue of abortion or getting vaccinated. I don't think people are waking up like, I don't own any crypto and I hate crypto and I'm going to, you know what I mean? So it seems like a layup issue for politicians. Yeah, no, I, th- I think it is too. I think, in, you know, in the past, the hurdles you had to get over, like I was mentioning before, were, oh my gosh, this is just used for money laundering or, oh my goodness, this is like sucking up all of the energy or something like that. I mean, that's, those are 
easily addressable with like a little bit of education. And I think that, I mean, even CNBC the other morning had did a whole interview with the secret service and how they were tracking, um, you know, different transactions, uh, you know, that are on a blockchain. And, and, you know, I think when, when policymakers understand the tools that they're available and they understand the transparent nature of blockchains um, it's actually, um, you know, a, a, a boon to law enforcement when Bitcoin is used in a crime as opposed to, you know, cash in the banking system. So, yeah, once you get beyond those initial questions and you get into this idea of, um, you know, the peer to peer nature of digital assets, the, the fact that you can do all these NFTs and there's this whole element of um, individual ownership like this is all very interesting and cool to people. And it's not just an asset where price goes up and down. There, there's a lot of really cool infrastructure that's being deployed on top of these networks. And so I think, um, you know, I think in the long run, you know, that's going to serve us well. It's just, you know, it just took a long time to get over that initial hurdles of, of misunderstanding about the misuse of crypto, which turns out to be a very, very small percentage of, of all of the activity. Um, so I have one more question, which and then I'll, I'll throw over to John, who might might have a couple of his own. For this question, if if uh, you're unable to answer, I'll totally understand. So just <laughs> so, you know, the SEC brought an enforcement action against Ripple. Um, and there's a lot of eyes on this. And, you know, right, the big question is whether or not uh, Ripple, uh, which is one of the larger, for those who don't know, it's one of the larger cryptocurrencies, uh, whether the sale was essentially an unregistered sale of securities. Um, and it's looking to hold the founders personally liable as well. It's getting a lot of attention. It's supposed to go to trial in August. Um, do you have a view on that? I guess what it might mean for the industry, big deal, little deal, no deal. Yeah, no, I think um, we don't have a, a position on sort of the specifics of the case itself, um, though I would say one of the things I, I, you know, people have very mixed opinions on Ripple. I, I'm, I'm happy to have them as a member of the Blockchain Association. I'm also happy that they're fighting and that, you know, whatever you think about them, they are, they're all in on this. And if this you know, there's many different ways that this could play out. But one of those ways is that this provides a lot of certainty for everyone else in the industry. And I think that um, it's something that, you know, we're watching very closely. Um, I think, you know, it sounds like this is going to continue to take some time. Um, but yes, if this does what they think it's going to do and redefine how we determine what's a security or not, in the best case scenario, um, you know, that could be very good for everyone else. Um, you know, they may not go that way and it, you know, who knows what, what the court will decide, but um, there's certainly a pathway where this could be, uh, provide some much needed guidance for the rest of the industry. Well, I'll say something a teeny bit more controversial, which is, you know, just by analogy, um, this, the civil rights uh, uh, community selected Rosa Parks. She was like a very specific choice to be the face of that movement. Um, I don't think the Ripple folks are the best face of this movement for the crypto. I think the the, the atmospherics in the case, uh, the details of the case, um, you know, don't don't paint a flattering pictures at all times. So I, 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 you know, I think the issues at play here are significant, and and I wish there weren't. I wish there was a better fact set than the one that the case presents. Um, so, you know, that's as polite as I can say it. Um, John, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have uh, some? Uh, All right. This we we, we do. You know, no one cares about my questions, but we do have some interesting questions from the audience, which we always love to get to on these live salt talks. So we're going to go to a couple of those, Kristen, uh, okay. screened by me, of course. Um, there was an article that was written, I think it was in I don't know, Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg, one of those outlets recently about how crypto lobbying organizations and advocates have done a pretty good job of starting at a more grassroots local level and educating politicians in cities and states and helping to craft more local uh, crypto related regulation that's been pretty supportive of the industry. 
in lieu of you know more sweeping regulation from the federal level. Uh, could you talk more about that strategy, how effective it's been, uh, and, and whether you think that's ev- eventually that grassroots movement is going to force people at the federal level to take note and step in and regulate the industry? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's so much like a, a strategy per se, other than it's just sort of how things have evolved, right? I don't think there was a decision like, let's go state and local first. I, I, I think, um, but I think it's it's great. It's not a bad place to start, right? Um, it's it's uh, small, it's defined. I think the problem we have is a lot of these issues can only be solved by the federal government, right? I mean, there's only so much competition states can have, um, you know, around like money transmitter licenses or something like that. But it's going to take... Um, a federal government level action to get clarity around securities policy or to get the right kind of information reporting rules put into place or to come up with a federal framework for regulating stable coins. I mean, there is a state framework today, but, um, I, you know, there's some things that we can really only do. I, I think what's been most helpful about the state and local activity. And for example, Wyoming, uh, there was a ton of effort put into passing state level legislation in Wyoming. And I think that is what empowered now Cynthia Lemus, who's on the Senate Banking Committee, to show up and be incredibly pro Bitcoin and to want to work on these issues because back home. So, you know, at the end of the day, like all politics is local, right? And so having a strong local presence, I think, is starting to filter up to the federal level, even though those solutions don't necessarily always translate. Um, But just I think the interest at the local level is is informing um, a lot of what's going on in Washington. We have another question around stable coins, and I think it's a fascinating question. We were at a conference with Jeremy Allaire. He was speaking about how his opinion is that the United States should not pursue a policy of developing its own central bank digital currency, which sort of betrays a lot of the ethos of crypto and decentralized finance, but rather more actively regulate the uh, the stable coin market. And I know Circle uh, has and USDC has taken a much more proactive approach in terms of being transparent and, and having its assets uh, that are backing its stablecoin uh, audited and regulated. But what is your view on stablecoins? Obviously, Tether being the largest one is, has been the subject of a lot of FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about whether they truly have the backing that they do for those assets. You also have algorithmic stablecoins, which a lot of people point to as a source of uh, you know potential volatility uh, w- within the crypto market. What is your general view on stablecoins? how they're being regulated now and how they might be regulated in the future. Yeah, well, I think there's a big distinction between, you know, sort of fiat or dollar backed stable coins and the algorithmic stable coins. Um, They really have two sort of different sets of issues. And I think kind of like all things DeFi, we want to, you know, watch what's going on in the algorithmic space before jumping in and, you know, putting a policy in place that might prevent some natural evolution of that space. But I think with the dollar backed stable coins, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion like this. Uh, largely, I think, thanks to our friends that were formerly at the Libra project that was formerly with Facebook, that was formerly known as Facebook. Um, that is a, uh, you know, that was really what caught everyone's attention. But I think, um, you know, I agree with with Jeremy um, at Circle. We work really closely with his team, happy to have them as members of the association. Um, We don't need a central bank digital currency. What we need, you know, that's what China does, right? Like that's how they, that's their top. It's an authoritarian tool more or less, right? right? Like like this is United States. We believe in empowering innovators. We should let the technologists come up with a digital wrapper to put around a dollar that makes it easier to use, right? Like we can have all of the same benefits you would want with like a retail type you know, CBDC by, you know, allowing it to be moved 24 hours a day, allowing it to be moved nearly instantly, um, allowing it to happen in really big payments or really like small micro payments. Like we can get all of those benefits today with USDC. And so I think the real question is, how does redemption work? Is that being disclosed to consumers? 
what are the reserves? Are they mostly in dollars or is there something else in the mix? Like what, what are the permissible sort of investments, not to steal the, the term from the, the state level policy, you know, what can you do with those investments to ensure that there really is going to be a dollar there? Um, we also have an, sort of an education issue because like the regular banks are like, you know, systemic risk. Oh, like they, they're used to fractional reserve banking. I think a lot of the vision that, um, the dollar back stablecoin issues or have is like maybe that needs to be like a fully reserved system. And it's for some reason that's a very difficult thing for the traditional regulators to get their heads around, even though in my mind it's like way simpler. So um so no, I think that there are some tweaks that we can make at the federal level, um, you know, to allow banks to issue stable coins, to allow non-banks to issue stable coins, to allow the states to continue to play a role. I think Senator Pat Toomey um, has put out a stable coin legislative proposal that's that's very thoughtful. Um, I think Josh Gottheimer, a Democrat in the House, has also put out a good proposal there. So I think that we can make some tweaks to ensure that those dollar backed stable coins are backed by a dollar, um, but we don't need a CBDC at the retail level. I mean, now there might be a case we already sort of have like digital currency at the wholesale level. That's like a different conversation, but you know, at the retail level, you know, I don't think we should try to out China China. Right. And I think, you know, Circle's been one of the hottest private companies in the crypto space. They just raised $400 million of additional capital, including from players like BlackRock. And I think it, it goes to show what you're describing is just the promise and excitement around stable coins and how they can be a driving force behind sort of revolutionizing our financial system. Uh, but Kristen, we're going to go ahead and, and leave it off there. It's been a fantastic discussion. Thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week in person in the Bahamas for the inaugural Crypto Bahamas. Uh, and you're, I know you're moderating a great conversation there that includes Jeremy Allaire. So if, if people, yeah. I know the event's sold out, so I hate to tease it and, and tell people they should, they should buy a ticket. But uh, if you're already coming, we look forward to seeing you there and enjoying a great event. And Kristen, look forward to, to seeing you there. And Brett, do you have any final uh, nice words for Kristen before we let her go? I mean, just great work, you know, um, uh, when we got involved in in uh, in Bitcoin, my biggest concerns were the China mining, which has gone away, uh, Tether, which I would characterize as, as mitigated, but still, you know, there, and the regulatory risk, which has been mitigated meaningfully. And, and uh, uh, Kristen was being um, uh, not giving herself enough credit. She was like at the forefront of the uh, infrastructure fight uh, last summer and, and played a key role in. Uh, uh, and sort of scoring us a, a quasi win, we'll call that, right, Kristen? It was a quasi win. It was it was the for a loss. It was a sure a hell of a win. So yeah. <laughs> it's funny we didn't actually change the language at the end of the day, but it's getting interpreted in a much more narrow way because of the political pressure. So yes, thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, Kristen Smith, the executive director of the Blockchain Association. And thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in to today's live Salt Talk, uh, which we always enjoy. And then thank you, everybody who, who tunes into this on demand as well. Uh, but just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk, you joined late, uh, you can always access them on our website on demand at salt.org backslash talks. Uh, or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. We're also on social media at Salt Conference on Twitter is where we're most active, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks. We love, uh, again, we've been working with people like Chris and to educate people in Washington around crypto and sort of debunk a lot of the uh, the FUD that we hear, uh, but but also you know, like educating uh, people that are, that are less familiar with crypto around the policy uh, around the industry. But uh, just, just on behalf of uh, Brett and the entire SALT team, I want to thank everybody again for tuning in and we'll see you next time on SALT Talks.